Thank you guys so much for coming out. I am Joanna Delorado Samuel Bernie, the director of Zach at Zach Shaman. Um, we're really excited to announce two of my favorite people, um, Trevor Spoonmaker and Radcliffe Bailey. Radcliffe showed downstairs in his gift with the gallery um, request, and I'm happy to say that it's been extended now until June 20th, so we have a little more time, but I hope everyone had a chance to see it. Um, the other is the official titles here. The Artistic Director of the U.S. Triennial Prospect New Orleans. It opens in November of next year. We're really excited about that. Um, he's also the Chief Curator and the Patsy R. and Raymond D. National Curator of Contemporary Art at the National Museum of Duke University. Um, so thank you so much. And we'll do questions after the lunch. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Jack Shaming Gallery. Thank you all of you for coming tonight. Um, I'm just going to open the floor to Radcliffe and let him go. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, you just tell me to take it easy on the floor. I want to start with uh, the fact that um, this speaking here is meaningful for us. Uh, um, Radcliffe, of course, is shown here for many years. And we've done conversations in other places in the past. We did a great conversation at the Cincinnati Contemporary Arts Center years ago on a bourbon-filled snowy night um, around <laughs> the Kuti exhibition and um, had a lot of fun there. So we were happy to, to take another stab at it tonight. Um, but I was also talking to Radcliffe about the interesting fact that it's just not why we're paired together, but we're both, we're both Southerners in the art world. Um, working in this international global art world, uh, both based in the South, but um, more or less from the South. Rafa was born in Jer New Jersey, but grew up in Atlanta. I'm from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I presently work in Durham. I lived in New York for many years and moved back home. Um, and maybe I want to start Radcliffe there with like what, um, what does it mean to you to be a practitioner, an artist working in, in the South? Hmm. Well, I mean, it's a strange space to operate in. I think, um, well, number one, my parents, uh, we moved to Atlanta in 1972 when I was four. And my brother was three and I was four. We moved to Atlanta. My parents were trying to make the decision whether or not to move to Florida, California, or Canada. <laughs> the reason why Canada came up is that, number one, we were from uh, South Jersey. So we were from more so the rural country part of Jersey. And so my parents wanted to raise me and my brother in a different environment. And so we drove around and uh, my parents went down and drove down, headed to Florida and stopped in Atlanta. And they met, uh, they stopped at a, a hotel that was called Pascal's. Back in the day, it was called Pascal's, and Pascal's was an African American hotel. It was the place where Dr. King would have his meetings, and so my mother and father stayed there. And in the morning, they got up and they pulled out this big map. And as they were looking at the map, trying to figure out places to go, there was this older guy, and he was like in his 80s. His name was Reverend Tobin. Reverend Tobin was a teacher of Dr. King, and at the time, um, Reverend Tobin walked up to them and showed them the city. And when he showed them the city, um, they decided to move immediately. And so Reverend Tobin's wife uh, came back up to New Jersey with my mother and helped my mother pack up and we moved to Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that was it. But, it but, but, you know, the other side of it was that um, the reason why um, Canada came up was because um, my family was a part of the Underground Railroad and they were... As, as a part of the Underground Railroad, they ended up migrating up to New Jersey and met some practice in South Jersey and ended up stopping instead of going straight to Canada. And so um, at the time, I did the reverse migration. Mm -hmm. um, the re reverse migration at the, at the same time, moving to Atlanta, that was four years after King was assassinated. Um, it was a whole different environment. And then we were in a neighborhood that was being seen as white flight at the time where you know people were just moving out the neighborhood and African Americans were moving in. But it's also I say that it's a strange space to operate in because uh, 
um, we have a strange history, especially in Atlanta, of rebuilding and burning and tearing things up back and forth. I mean, the city is always, you don't really have to, uh, you can't really see traces of the past, but you can feel traces of the past. Um, you know, you think about the Civil War, if you want to get rid of something, you burn it. And so the soul of this city is kind of a strange space. Um, it's always been kind of difficult to operate in. Uh, I always have to, well, number one, I always see the South as anywhere below the Mason-Dixon all, all the way to Texas as one big state. <laughs> and so I think of it as like all the museums and all the galleries as one big place instead of me looking at Atlanta as the place where I would have to function. I always thought of all these different places. And when I first started showing work, um, I showed, I think my, my first museum show was right after college. I showed at the Nick Museum in Charlotte. And uh, so it, it opened me up in a different way. So you've you've not been working you've not been in a small pond you've been in a huge pond right so to speak right big lake big lake <laughs> big lake big water um, and in what ways has it been uh, a disadvantage do you feel mm, I don't necessarily have visits as often but I'm in a space where I'm just kind of by myself and I have to like have conversations with myself. Sometimes it's hard to find a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> You've always got yourself pregnant. <laughs> Call me up and I'll drive down. Um, I was there not too long ago, but it's not close enough. Um, well, that, actually that takes me to sort of the title of your show, which is Quest. Um, because you know you were you were talking about just a moment ago about Atlanta and the erasure of history, and you are always unearthing history in your work and making historical connections. Um, uh, quest being a, 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 an arduous, long journey, looking for something. Are you are you searching for that history? Is it quest for self? Quest for yeah. Where, where's that title come from? Yeah, yeah, just a quest. Just a moment quest. Um, yeah, just on a quest. I mean, it's, for me, it's pretty, I've always been in search of uh, things that exist in the South that go unnamed. Part of the reason was is because I was thinking about the slave trade and thinking about the Africans that came through the South and some of the things that they left behind. Some of the things like, I mean, there, are, there is self-taught art, but there are other things that are not necessarily made to be art. There's something else. Um, I really picked it up. Number one, my, I always give like a lot of like thanks to my mother in, in, the, in a simple way, because my mother's a school teacher, and basically being in the South, we, all we had was each other, me, my mother, my father, my brother. And so every summer, every holidays, we would always go back and forth up to visit our family members in Virginia, Philadelphia, New Jersey. And along that trip, my mother would create this list of places to go. My father was like, we can go fishing. My mother would, my mother would be in this historical moment. I remember going to George Washington Carver's lab um, when it was intact. Um, and my mother taking me. I remember going off the coast of the Carolinas. Um, I remember going through some of the plantations and places that exist. I remember meeting just different people and understanding people spoke a different way. Um, and so, like, I'm, I'm constantly trying to figure out those things that we don't know about that are unknown. Um, but in the South, it's, you know, it's a big laugh. It is a big lab. In the in the press release, it specifically mentions a, a, a reference to the Maroons, um, uh, both freed and escaped slaves uh, that moved to the Great, uh, found a refuge or haven in the Great Dismal Swamp in sort of northeastern North Carolina and southeastern Virginia. Um, that, as to me, you, know, you mentioned that your family has historical connections to the Underground Railroad, which is the narrative that we know well. Few people actually know this narrative very well of the maroon culture in, in 
eastern North Carolina and, and southern Virginia. Um, it seems like you're always digging for these lesser known stories and using them as a, as a way to sort of get at something else. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. There's one thing about, I will say about my work is that I don't, you know, I have a hard time titling work and I have a hard time explaining work. There are reasons why I've learned to, um, well, within my work, to put it out there whatever way it comes out and then learn from the work afterwards. That being conversations that people may come up to me and share certain information, so I'm gathering information, so I feel like the work is actually functioning for me in a different way. I don't propose to, I don't know anything, I just want to know more. Um, and my work has always been like that. I always find myself as like, when I'm in my studio, this is like a, like a church. I'm not a religious person, but this is like a church. This is where I go and pray and find, solve problems. And, um, and I throw it out in the work. And hopefully, I get answers that lead me into different directions. But um, in terms of like understanding the curiosity about the Dismal Swamp, was like, as a kid, my father was a railroad engineer. And so we would always catch this train called the Southern Crescent. It would leave out Atlanta around 7 on, I think, Thursday, 7, 7 p.m. And my father worked for Southern Railways. So we would always get on the train, and my father knew all the conductors, and I would hang out on the train. But I had this dream about understanding, like, I wonder what the Underground Railroad would have been like. So thinking about migrating from Atlanta up north, I was thinking about the trails and the paths that people went through in some of those areas. And that's kind of how that kind of came into my work. It came in from, from that point of view rather than uh, something that I read about. It was more like understanding, like my grandfather was a, um, used to work at Monticello. And he would give the stories about uh, Monticello. He, one time he, he told this story about, um, it snowed. Basically, he was the last person there and had to lock up. And the snow was so bad, he had to stay at Thomas Jefferson's place. And a guy interviewed him in the paper and said, so Mr. Coles, what did you do? He said, I went to bed. So he basically jumped in Thomas Jefferson's bed. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's my grandfather. That's just nice. how, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> but um, I think about like understanding some of those things, not by way in which you read them, but you feel them, you hear them, you smell them, you, you're in the presence. and. Um, my work has always been about like trying to get a sense of that. But part of it is like those things that you don't know, how am I supposed to know them? But to just put myself in the situations or in the place, you know. Um, I remember seeing the, I think it's called the 14 year, 17 year, uh, when the cicadas come out. Mm -hmm. And I got caught in, in Virginia with my grandfather, and I remember the swarm of all these cicadas around him. And, you know, that's a, that's a whole different thing, too, because it goes beyond um, my own personal experience. Right. So you're able to use your own personal experience. I mean, all of your work seems like an exploration of your own history to get out larger, more universal stories right. in some way, right? Yeah. And so you're always mining history, and there's historical specificity in your work in, in terms of references. But the way that you bring them together is, uh, I don't know, lack of a better word, abstracted in some way. Or um, there's, a, there's an element of mystery that's always in the work. Um, you're invested in lore and mythology. And the way that you tie these things together is, I mean, you know, I would, it's almost like in literature, it'd be like um, uh, historical fiction. Sure. Right, so like you take a, you have a historical precedent, and then you weave it the way that you need to, or in, all, in the way that you work with um, the magic that is always in your work is like magical realism. Can you speak to that sort of um, that that transformative element, the way you bring very disparate materials, objects, even colors together, and try and make them work? <coughs> well, I always think about painting. Think about painting. It's like playing chess. Um, I suck at chess. 
I learn more from losing than winning. Um, I like to be put in very difficult situations, so sometimes I'll put colors together that don't necessarily work well together, and I'm trying to figure out a way I'm basically creating a problem to solve. Um, and then there's another part where it's like, <coughs> Artists, artists in general, you know how I see artists in general, we're all like tricksters. And we have a way in which we want to share our, our experiences, our stories. We want to tell lies, we want to tell truths. Uh, we don't necessarily want to give everything. You know, I think there's a part of holding that's very important. Um, you know, I don't know if I answered the question. Well, I think in your trickster way, you did. Uh, and um, the, the elusive Rackles Bailey. I mean, you, you have references to, uh, if you're calling yourself as artists, sort of referencing the tricksterdom. Um, you have references to Eshu, the, the Yoruba, um, you know, God of the Crossroads, and the communicator between humanity and, and, uh, and the Orisha. And also to, you know, in Haiti, Papa Legba. And so those references are there. Uh, I think this idea of communication is really important in your work, the, uh, telling a story uh, of, of bridging worlds. There's always, you know, even frequently have sort of cosmological or navigational elements in your work. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, sort of drawing things together, pulling worlds together? Like the way you always, you dig to the past, you mine history, but you really, in my opinion, really speaking about the present. Um, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, there are certain things that just, I don't, I personally don't, you know, as much as I make references, and sometimes I'm being very specific about references, but I think it's also, there's a part of it that can't really be spoken about as much as, but I think about sometimes somebody going to see a practitioner and how specific that is to a certain problem that that person may have and trying to explain it is difficult and it's also there's a conflict within that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sensitive about that. I understand different practices. I don't know everything about every different practice, but the one part about it is that I'm real <coughs> fascinated with trying to acknowledge that there <coughs> are practices and there have been practices throughout the South and still go on in different ways. And they're almost dying in a way. And so I am curious about that. Um, I do make references to, I think about, you know, I think about a lot of things that are practices in West Africa, but also think beyond. I'm, all, I'm very curious about being, being beyond, but it's almost like there's a history and there's, there are these symbols and there's things, but it's also, comes up to be a very human thing and goes beyond and it has to do with us existing here on this planet in a certain way and I am very curious about things in other places mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you know and I don't know we don't have the answers we can call that planet this that and those are really not the names of those places <laughs> right. and some right. of them don't even have names and right. I have a hard time with the fact that sometimes we segregate things and we put it in this place or that place when it's all one and the same. Right. You know, and I think part of it is just that when once it comes to the point where we embrace all these things, that's when, that's when I feel the, would feel the best that I could make something that doesn't, I hope to someday make things that don't necessarily have to be literal or there has to be a narrative I just want to make. But I feel like I have to make a comment or <coughs> have a, try to create a conversation around those things. So uh, are you saying you're, you're, is, the, is the goal in some way to elicit an emotional response or a feeling Right. From the person engaging with the work. Right. It's like right. music. Yeah. Exactly. It's like music. You're listening to certain sounds and certain rhythms. And I think I had a piece downstairs and it was, it was all based on, it has a rock on it. It's all based on Bob Marley. Very simple, very basic, mm -hmm. like thinking about just from the beginning. And Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, rock yeah, with you. Rock with you. Yeah, exactly. Got it. And so it's all about dance, but it's all about rhythm, but it's, it's a little more complicated too. Uh, 
Yeah. Is that so? I mean, I know music factors heavily, and we see a sort of Sun Ra reference here. I mean, you've referenced um, many musicians directly and indirectly in your work. Blues musicians, you've done work around Fela and, and others. Um, but music, I think that what you said earlier, rhythm, this idea of rhythm being the thread that holds everything together in your work. Yes. Because you move between two-dimensional, three-dimensional installation, but it all has a very familiar rhythm, no matter what medium you're working in. Uh, that music is, is music the glue, or is that rhythm sort of the glue? Yeah, music is glue. Music is like the DNA. Um, yeah, it's DNA for even DNA. You know, even before testing DNA, it's, you know, we all relate to a certain sound or rhythm. Certain, certain and it's something to aspire to, maybe, because, I mean, music, <coughs> more than anything, can elicit that sort of transportive feeling immediately when you hear something. Right. And to strive for that in visual art, I think, is why I respond to your work, because I, I feel it with the work. Um, and it's the way I work as a curator also. I mean, it's to have a feeling when you enter an exhibition, a feeling when you see a particular work as opposed to exclusively an intellectual response. Um, I think that you need both, um, and, you, and you achieve that in the work. Um, what about, let's talk about your process a little bit, and, and how you, uh, where you start, let's say, when it's, um, you start with the concept, or you start with material, sort of, Building and putting materials or objects together. What's, where, where's your beginning, right? I think I started back in college. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. But seriously, I feel like I, I keep a lot of the past, mm -hmm. and I'm always searching for something new. As much as I look for things that are old, I'm looking for things that are new. I collect a lot of objects, and I collect a lot of information, books, um, you know, just things, and I kind of pile them in the studio, mm -hmm. and then eventually I start working. But I think that the work is not necessarily the finished work. There's something else that it's about the process and it's about the dance, the move. I think that that's more important. I think just as much as we think about an artist's work, I think that the person themselves are just as important as the objects. Um, that's just the residue. Mm -hmm. I think that the person, the way they function and operate within the world, which is more important than the actual object. So, but do you, so do you have a vision in mind for what the end? I struggle with that. I would yeah. never, I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't tell. Right. I think sometimes, I think it's when the truck shows up. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time knowing when to stop. Which I'm comfortable with. Yeah, yeah. You figured it out. And when's it? When, how about titles? How about titles? I struggle. I, I actually have a. I, I do this thing. I probably in the past six or seven years, I have groups of friends that I ask, and I say, I say, can you help me title this? And because I like um, the back and forth. Right. I like the back and forth, and I think it's important you have friends and you can do the back and forth. Because um, sometimes we can be in our studios and lock ourselves away from everyone, and it's, you know, for me, my work is, it, it, it's, I've always thought about it, it's not about me, it's about something else. About the dialogue? It's about right. The conversation? It's more about that, and I don't think that happens as much as it may have once happened. I mean, in general. In, in general, in yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. But what you're striving for, so if you have questions, we can open it up in a little while. Um, Let's we'll start that dialogue. Um, not right now, um, <laughs> but but you're, you're opening yourself to that. Um, uh, and in in the material process, in terms of, let's take for instance, well, there's not really a sculpture work, but even your two dimensional work always has a collage <coughs> element that makes it more three dimensional, right? So um, yeah. is that a like a, a very organic? Let's see where it goes, or did you, you know, Madagascar that came up? Were you thinking about something very specific in, in this work in particular and producing it? Like you're saying, you accumulate these objects, you're a collector, you have these um, images, uh, imagining what it might be in your studio. Do they become actually part of the work? Or are they inspiration, or is it both? Yeah, it's both. And I mean, you know, I was thinking about African art. 
and my first encounters with African art was in, you know, or in different museums and the objects that were chosen to be put out on display. And I just remember interacting and trying to figure out how, what what is that about? Because I couldn't really understand what, what was being written. I didn't really necessarily believe what was being written because I felt like those that made and d made those things were not necessarily going to re reveal that information. Like that one in general was from uh, the Disney collection of the Smithsonian and it was from Madagascar and it was a funerary statue and I was just wanting to respond to it. But I didn't necessarily, I had a respect for it, but I had a distance from it, but I wanted to respond to it and have a conversation. So it's almost like collecting objects. I'm, I'm collecting them visually in my mind or from photographs or collaging. And I just remember as a, I was a student in painting, I had this, I couldn't paint work with shit. I would just, I wanted to like say, well, why am I going to paint this image? Why don't I take a copy of this image? Why don't I put it over here? And then at the time, we, you know, our, our references as a young African American artist were these references to like the Harlem Renaissance, and it would be, it'd be like from, from Bearden to Lawrence, and there was a narrative. And then when I look at Bearden, I was like, oh, he's collaging this object. So I was really looking at that, and I started thinking of how to kind of put these things together and thinking about how things are so fragmented and thinking about this you know, stuff that people talk, we've talked about this before, about quilts and putting these things together, objects and sounds and places and, and combine them all together to make something that is more futuristic that can do something totally different. I mean, it's just like hip hop music, same way. Um, but I look at all that and in terms of the way in which I work, but I wanted to, bring in almost anything and everything throughout wherever I go. Uh, they're almost like riffs, they're almost like sounds and rhythms and I, I just wanted to combine in different ways. So if your your painting professors weren't um, Yeah, they weren't, didn't like that. They weren't yeah, supportive of that. <laughs> so where did you get where did you get that um, drive to move into more accumulative assemblage, you know, um, was it wh what was your inspiration for that? Was it self-taught vernacular work? Was it artists that you saw? Was it just coming from inside you? It was all, it was yeah. all. And I, I mean, honestly, I look at everything. And I remember when I was in art school, um, <clears throat> I went to Atlanta College of Art. We had this big library of stuff. And my attitude was every day during lunch, I'd walk into the library and I'd grab, start from here and work my way all the way across the library. And visually, I would look at everything, everything. Just one day, just and so I, you know, I start picking up information from everywhere, looking at art from everywhere. So as much as I'm trying to reference things that are related around practices or you know, influence by West Africa or just African American art, I'm looking at everything. And you're and you're bringing it together in a way that allows you to discuss some of these themes that uh, we talked about earlier, like. Um, you know, delving into your own personal ancestry to look at, uh, like you've talked a lot about memory, um, communal memory, cultural memory, um, ways that you've ways you've gone through that through the personal. And you mentioned collecting, uh, whether it be things that you've looking at books or they're visiting museums, but you've also used your own uh, photo archive a lot, right? Your family, right. Your family history. I can you speak a little bit about that and how that became a sort of important foundational element in your work? Yeah, yeah. I think the thing that made it that made it important for me and made it personal for me that it was outside of art school. And the reason why I say that is because my grandmother, right before she passed, she pulled out this old family album. And I just remember I was like the youngest kid at the table, and for some reason my grandmother, she had a sense of uh, that I like to draw. As a kid, but she wanted to bring out this family album right before she passed, and she didn't know a lot about art, and gave it to me. And I felt obligated to use those images. And out of all those images, we didn't know. We knew only about maybe fifteen percent of the images, and so I felt like those images would have be became discarded. So. Those images end up becoming, for me, like deities. Mm. They come back and forth, in and out the work. Um, 
And then shortly after, I had the opportunity to meet James Vanderzee. And that was like a big influence. And, and it was my mom introduced to me, hmm. taking me to hmm. see a show. Where was and that? My, um, this was in Atlanta. There was a show at the, a place called Nexus. Now they call it the Contemporary yeah. Center. But um, I just remember as a kid, you know, those opportunities. Um, and, you know, I look at my mom as the biggest teacher. I was going to say, she's played a big role. Right. But she would, she's like this shy person that would never ever say anything. She would be back sitting way in the corner. But, you know, I, I have to allow those parts of me to, you know, influence my work, be it like simple things. It was like a piece downstairs that I have like a mint green that I use and I paint on the wall of a, a cabinet. And that was, it's just, for me, it's like a personal symbol that relates around my grandfather because he had this one room in his house, he painted this mint green, and my grandmother allowed him to have this one room. <laughs> to keep his things, to keep his objects, and he made bird houses, but he, but it's, you know, but that's a way of like, for me, like creating symbols. Right. You know? Do you have your own room? I have my own room. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what, color, what color is it? It's painted white right now. <laughs> Just, you made me think of Louis Armstrong having his own room where he collaged he would he would make collages of all of the um, uh, on the audio tapes. So he would do these recordings, like any conversation, he'd record everything, and he would collage over the over the cases, and he collaged an entire room. And he went on a tour in Europe, and his wife asked him if she could redecorate. He said, "Yeah," and he wasn't thinking about his room. <laughs> it's all gone when he got back. Um, sorry, that was a little bit of an aside. Um, but uh, but uh, back to, back to your mother. Um, um, given her influence on you and the, and the important role that she's played, uh, what is she, how supportive has she been of, of your actual art making? She, yeah, she's yeah. the person who, like, who comes to see my work right before it leaves. Yeah. And she will tell the truth. Yeah. And she'll just say, I just don't like that. Yeah. Or if there's a certain feeling that she gets out of it, she doesn't like it. Um, she goes to open she's, it. That's my there. critic. Yeah. yeah. That's, she comes in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I've always wanted to make work that spoke to, that was one foot over here and one foot over here. Meaning like I am interested in having a conversation in art, art world, but I'm more so interested in having a conversation with those that don't necessarily come or feel invited. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the part that's probably the most important. So, you know, often I have kids, I often, you know, just friends and yeah. people who just and I allow that to become a part of my work too. Um, I try. Yeah. So I mean, work, and then you have to create um, openings for that, right? You have to create points of entry, which you do. And there's recognizable elements here, even just looking at this. It may be enigmatic or a little abstract in terms of like what actually is happening, but we can see the the, the photograph, the full stick. There's things that pull you in, right? Right. Um, oh, and that. Yeah. yeah that, the photograph is a photograph. That's one of my family photographs. But I made a I made a piece about these. Um, I created a story based on something that I read and something that I <coughs> noticed that when I would go to these old antique fairs, there would be people selling all these kind of strange images from KKK emblems to. You know, whenever somebody was hung, they would cut body parts of people. And so within that photograph, the guy, when he's holding a pool stick, he has a uh, fingers cut off. And so for me, it was really about drawing a connection to talking about that, mm. even though it's not as literal and not as obvious, but there's a moment where I can talk about it. And I believe in dealing with like very painful subject matters with beauty. And if I feel like if I can share beauty, I can open it up in such a way where I can have a conversation about the paintings. Well, yeah, well, beauty is probably the sharpest tool you can use, right? So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what about, let's say, just while we're looking at this image, where's the, the, the pull stick? Is that something you had in mind early on? Was it added in late? How did this... I'm really thinking about the process and how, uh, no, how it's just how real it random. And develops. This is real random. I like to play pool. I'm not necessarily good at it, yeah. but I like to play pool. There's a part of like games and 
and sports and seeing sports as, you know, not just straightforward, this is a sport. This is more like, it's more personal. Sometimes it can be a war. Sometimes, it, you know, there's things that happen. My first passion was baseball. Mm. I wanted to play baseball so bad. I was fascinated with like the Negro Leagues. I was, um, I grew up like seeing Hank Aaron as a kid come out when I played Little League. And then that drew me into trying to understand who he was and what he did. Um, so when I think about this piece, uh, it's about those sports. And it's about that game. That's more than a game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's more like Ali. Mm -hmm. right. It's more than boxing. Right. There's something else to it too. There's more, you know, it's like an artist. There's more than that object. It's, there's something else about that person. Uh, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Well put. Uh, you've mentioned, you've mentioned Ali, you've mentioned Van Der Zee, you've mentioned others. Are there any particular um, inspirational figures that you would, you would reference for us who have uh, been muses, so to speak? Uh, inspired. I like to send, I like to send a police film like Usman Siyunga, and um, I'm thinking about strategies and understanding, you know, things like that. I like, um, I like Albert Eiler. I like, you know, jazz musicians that are way out there. I like, there are people that are not necessarily known that are friends of mine that are, you know people that are organizers and their community people that build organizations and stuff like that, that just their names don't go known and they don't care for their names to be known so sometimes I won't even acknowledge their names because I don't think they care they don't want to be looked upon in that way and you know there's people like that um, very simple people you know very you know but in your way you give them a presence right even if they're not directly referenced yeah and they give me objects and things to use within my work. Okay. And they give me references and places. So it's sometimes I don't, I don't look at it as like it's just me making my work. I look at it as like I have this whole slew of individuals who are all around and that gather information and share with me just like my grandma. Right. Right. It's good to have a team. Right. Um, how are we doing with time? A few more minutes. Okay. Um, just riffing off of images now, Radcliffe. I know you use um, maps a lot and boats a lot, and of course you've talked about things like the Middle Passage, but I know that boats are mean a lot more to you than that. Can you speak a little about the, the boat and the ship as a motif in your work? Right, right. I keep thinking about, you know, if I use it, when I'm interested in using boat, I think about spiritually traveling somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not necessarily by sea. Sometimes it's by space. I always compare sea and space as one and the same because the deeper you go in space, the more trouble you get in. The deeper you go in the sea, the same <laughs> way. But we always sit at the crossroads between those two. Love it. Um, maybe, maybe it's a good time to yeah. open up for some questions for Rackle. All right. How do you know when your picture is done on a piece? How do I know when it's done? I struggle with that. I still struggle with that. I always, I came up with a thing where it's like I decided when I was going to stop was going to be on the seventh layer <laughs> because I always, I, I, I didn't know when to stop. And really, sometimes the seven layers, seven layers of thought, or actually seven physical layers. Um, so it's a combination of those. But I don't know. It's usually when the truck shows up. I'm oh. being honest. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but then it's also I look at every 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 piece is like a page out of a book, out of a person's history. Every page there comes a page when it comes a new body of work, there comes a new chapter, and then I keep on and on and on. I do not abandon anything I've done before in the past. I embrace it even more, and I change it and flip it and. Instead of working it this way, I choose and work it a different way. Sometimes I work with sound. Sometimes I work with uh, painting or sculptural, and I just change it around. <coughs> Is it important for you that all your works can have a conversation with one another, not just in the show downstairs as a cohesive element, but dating back to you know when you said you started in college? Yeah, I think it's I would you know I think it's important. I would love for you know, to see work, you know, someone like yourself, 
place it in a different <laughs> way and, and, you know, change it around. That's always nice to see it and hear it and see the conversations that we're going to have. Different conversations. Yes. Yeah. Question there. Hi. I, I wanted to know, what I know for sure is that energy is never destroyed. And that when you go and you look into history, that there can be cosmic energy and, and pain that can be transferred through the process. And I just wanted to ask, as an artist who's been doing it for a while, like how do you use self-care to make sure that the mental work that might get stirred up for you emotionally doesn't distract you from real life and your relationships? You know what I mean? So that you create this work, <laughs> and you have an opening, and you, you have an opening, and you can be a distance from it because there are mysteries that are being unlocked. But emotionally, there must be some repercussions for you. And I'm just curious about what your self-care routine is in order to make sure that you can do it. I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> do you understand the question? No, I do. I do. I do. No, I have to. Um, I've learned to let things go. Perfect. <laughs> right, right. But I've learned to let things go. I think it, the uh, first time I remember selling a piece of art and I was using some family stuff and I just, I had a hard time letting it go because it was personal. Right. And then I just said, well, you know, somebody's going to preserve it. <coughs> and it's going to live beyond me. And hopefully the person who preserves it will take care of it and it will have a life. And my children will understand that and see that, and I can lead that, <coughs> and that's a good feeling. Um, it is a struggle sometimes going to the well, and the well feels dry, but then you're tired, and then you realize like it's an emotional thing. It's not a, you can't just turn it, I can't turn it on like a cruise control and it just happens. Right. For me, I just have to like step away, I have to disappear, take everything, clean out the studio completely, sweep the floors, <coughs> walk away, teach myself how to paint again, teach myself how to make things again, try something new, you know, there's all that. But I'm, I'm, but I'm fine in terms of letting it go. Do you have a question? Zelda, do you have a question? Yeah, well thank you, Greg, and Trevor. One is, one is sort of a comment and the other is, is a bit of a question. Um, one of the things that I've always admired about you, um, Radcliffe, right, in, in sort of both your lived experience and your artistic practice is your ability to kind of live in the gray space and um, mm -hmm. kind of almost relish the, the discomfort, those kind of uncomfortable spaces. I don't know how you do it. Um, I maybe sat in one of them for about two minutes with you and then just bounced right out of there. But I see a lot of that in your work, and especially in the way that you move very fluidly between the two-dimensional and the three-dimensional. And I was going, I was thinking about the image that you just had up, but I'm wondering in terms of um, how you bring all of that together. I've seen two-dimensional work separately. I've seen, you know, your sort of three-dimensional <coughs> sculptural or sort of pieces separately, and then also the installation. And I'm wondering in terms of your process when you create two-dimensional, three-dimensional, um, are you thinking of it um, as an entire installation, or do you just sort of create the pieces and sort of see kind of what feels cohesive to you? Um, can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, it's a lot of push and pull. I mean, there are things that I start, I think about them in a particular way, and then all of a sudden it doesn't work, and then I take it apart, and then I throw it in something else. Then I pull up something that I have from like, 1993 to 92, and then all of a sudden it ends up in a conversation. Then I was like, oh, okay, all right, I need to go and work in metal. Okay, <laughs> I need to, okay, I need to get away. You know, I need to, and, you know, it's part of it's the exercise, and um, it's really the exercise. I really like to just try to exercise my brain and my body and try to figure out a way to make something happen. I'm not answering your question the way you, but, no, no, you are, and I'm just, I'm, I, I, that's really helpful to kind of think about sometimes when you, when I see installations of your work, like your incredible show at Baha'i Museum, there were singular pieces, but there were also these just massive installations, and so this idea that you create these individual pieces, and sometimes you have a vision for them as sort of a collective within the context of an installation, and then sometimes they just end up as singular pieces. It's best when I feel insecure, too. 
Yeah. yeah. When I feel uncomfortable and insecure, that's when I feel like it. That's the best for me. Yeah. You should bottle that and sell it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> In the concept of your artwork, is it realism or surrealism? How do you, how do you what do you say, it? surrealism? Yeah, you, I can see some certain abstraction in certain work, yeah. or certain surrealism. Certain, well, I, was, I mean, so I always think about you, certain surreal is real to some people. And I always <laughs> thought, like, um, there's, a, there's that part of where I feel like I live in my dreams and I catch up during the day. And there's, just, there's something strange. But yeah, there's, there is that. And part of it is, um, I don't know. That's, I mean, I'm still, I'm asking myself that question too. So you, you mean you're a <coughs> person style, style? No, I, I just, I'm, I think I'm forever looking for a way for a new way, a different way. A friend of mine told me, he said, always consider myself forever an emerging artist. Yeah. And um, I took that and I, I'm always trying to figure out new ways to emerge and different. And, and still at the same time, at my own pace. Greg, if I remember years ago when I visited you and you uh, pulled out Gordon Dial's book and the shock waves that went through me and how much you talked to me about him as a person and his art and what an influence it had on you. Can you tell us about some of the other artists that have had a big impact on your vision? I would say those, you know, there's a Gordon Dial. If I go down the list, I think I've come up with like hundreds. Mm -hmm. And I always feel like I might have left, left someone out. Or give us five. <laughs> just, give, just give us five. 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 <laughs> five. <laughs> you know, there are. Oh it's hard. It's hard. It's, uh, it's hard to rank them. <laughs> no, I mean, it is. No. But there are, I mean, beyond the self-taught, uh, you know, there are temporary artists that I like, you know, I, I, you know, I love people like David Hammond. I love, um, you know, I, let me see, there was, there was something, let me see, there probably other day. I love Bob Thompson. Some, some Dadaism? Bob Thompson. Yeah, I love, um, I don't know. What's her name? Martin Luther King? Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Recently, who died? Um, what's Terry Atkins? Yeah, Terry's there, but um, <laughs> someone who died. Nice. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yes. Nice. Yes. Nice. yes. Yes. Yeah, you can see that. Yeah. Yeah, because I used to make these kind of stage prop kind of paintings. And I remember that was one of those influences when I was in art school looking through those books. And, but it goes on, on, on. Um, Radcliffe, um, I'm interested in like, when the work goes from your studio to a gallery and you walk in and see it in the gallery, if the work change or if it shows up differently for you, like you know, out of the context of your studio and you're working with it, and then all of a sudden it's in this, you know, neutral, well lit white wall. Right. Does the work change yeah. for you? Yeah. Yeah, it changes. I see things I didn't see. Yeah. <coughs> but I like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I like that the work can go and function somewhere else yeah. and do something totally different. Yeah. That my studio is very dark. And it's and I mean if there's a like it's not it's not bright. Yeah. And actually I prefer working at night. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. A, I mean there's a part, yeah. I enjoy watching it mm -hmm. in another space. I enjoy seeing it here in another yeah. space. I enjoy walking and going somewhere like a museum and, and being the fly on the wall. 
and no one knows. And you just, just walk in. And you're and listening I'm to I'm standing in the corner and my numbers come to come look at it. If they're going to look at it. <laughs> but I like that. Question. Um, the form piece that you had, what influenced that? That was a, uh, I had this thing about making things that were bigger than me. I have this body of work that I'm making that's all about being bigger than me. I have a baseball bat that's 10 feet tall. I have a railroad ladder that's <coughs> about 7 feet tall. I have a music stand that is, that's a music stand that I uh, made. And the music stand was about, I made it right after Katrina. And when I was in a when I was in Atlanta, there were friends that were flying into the Air Force Base in Atlanta, and I had to pick them up. There were fellow artists, and I had to pick some of them up at the Air Force Base. And I remember, like at the same time, that the music in New Orleans was still going on, <coughs> and the music musicians was traveling. They like hit the road, mm -hmm. and they started showing up in different <coughs> places. And there was the idea of propping up the music up and up high. And there was about another part of it was like those were instruments that were taken from New Orleans that were in the um, in the work and um, taken from school. So that's what that was about. I never I, for a long time I lived with that music stand and I didn't really know exactly what to do with it. And uh, I think I made it probably maybe I started on it maybe five years ago. I I, uh, I was on Google this this afternoon, mm -hmm. and I ran across the Terry Atkins, mm -hmm. uh, which reminds <coughs> me about his sculptural pieces. Mm -hmm. They figure me with horns going in and out, mm -hmm. and I said, "Oh my God, this is coincidental." Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he was a good friend. Oh, yeah, quite well. Yeah, yeah. I know him quite well. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you tell us about the time. Okay? <laughs> yes. Um, I was kind of interested, we've been talking a lot about an archive, and as someone who's also interested in that, but being 20 something and seeing my archive not being, it's just digital, I was kind of wondering if you could talk about that move from like a physical, tangible, object pulling to now that you digitize and what that means for like artists working in 20 years or people looking back at you know stuff that's from today is relevant to our history today. Mm. I just like to, to touch and smell and, yeah. and um, get it from a, a particular place. Mm -hmm. um, I do <coughs> and, you know I do I collect a lot of I don't know what to do with it, um, but yeah, just the, you know, I, I'm blown away sometimes when you go to an antique fair, you walk through it and you smell the past, mm -hmm. and you walk through it and you see these things, and you know, sometimes things speak to you, and then you find out the history behind them, how that history connects to you in a way. Um, I think, but then there's another side of it's like you know we as, a, as artists start to uh, collect and collect our objects and have them in a safe space so that one day they go somewhere. Uh, that's something I've been thinking about a lot, trying to figure out how to preserve these objects. You know, there was a time we used to have slides. <laughs> <laughs> And I still have my slides, and one day I said, ah, I should get rid of these. No. <laughs> uh, they'll have a life some, at some point. But um, I don't know. I was thinking about it, too, because I live in a place where, if I was in New York, and I lived, if I lived in New York, and I was thinking about the things that I collected, the objects, and my own personal archives, I don't know if it would be it would be looked upon a different way. Because I live in Atlanta and the pond is different, mm -hmm. there is this attraction towards my personal archives, which 
I'm starting to rethink and think about it in a different way because I didn't really think they were valuable. I thought they were only valuable to me. So now I'm starting to look at it in a different way. Um, I never really thought of it like that. But just because of the because of the poem. Okay. Well, I think we're going to end it there. But thank you.